Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Andrea Hall. I'm a family physician here in Calgary, practicing at the Mosaic Refugee Health Clinic and also the Elbow River Healing Lodge. It is my pleasure to welcome and introduce Dr. Ryan Miley today. I met Ryan at medical school in Saskatoon. His passion for health equity and global health interests quickly made him stand out and become a leader among his peers there. He has continued to progress and accomplish much in his career since then already. Dr. Miley is a family doctor at the Westside Community Clinic in Saskatoon and assistant professor at the College of Medicine, University of Saskatchewan, where he serves as the head of the Division of Social Accountability. Dr. Miley is also a co-lead of the SHARE, Saskatchewan HIV AIDS Research Endeavor. His 2012 book, A Healthy Society, How a Focus on Health Can Revive Canadian Democracy, has sold over 4,000 copies and helped stimulate a political dialogue around using health in all sectors approach to developing policy. Ryan serves as vice chair of the national advocacy organization, Canadian Doctors for Medicare, and he is the founding director of Upstream Institute for a Healthy Society. It is my pleasure to introduce Ryan Miley today. Well, good morning, and thank you, Andrea. It's a real treat to see you, a U of S fellow grad and pal, and, uh, and lots of other familiar, friendly faces in the room. So thank you very much for inviting me. And I find that, well, first of all, I find it's important to declare that my biases and are multiple, but they're not uh, rem remunerative for me in any way. So uh, no commercial interests whatsoever. I find it's always helpful to spend a little bit of time when meeting new people, spend a little time around the campfire, say who you are and where you actually come from. I'm a farm boy from Southern Saskatchewan who somewhere along the line got interested in social justice and global health and have been fortunate enough to have lots of mentors along the way who encouraged me in those interests. And that has led me to experiences in Brazil, India, Mozambique, which you see here, as well as working in northern Saskatchewan, all over rural Saskatchewan, and my current practice in inner city Saskatoon, where I work at a clinic called the Westside Community Clinic. And we serve a population that is largely First Nations and Métis, uh, uh, some refugee population sp speaking Spanish. I have Colombian and Mexican families that come for care with me, and then uh, exclusively, really, people who have issues with income, who ha have lower incomes, and who have other social challenges. And that work is very rewarding and extremely engaging and every day exciting to go to work. It's also work that can be extremely frustrating because the reality is, well, we don't necessarily get the tools in our medical training to actually know how to work with populations like that. And that may be because the tools don't even exist or they're not in what we would traditionally think of as our role as physician. So traditionally, this is the kind of advice that we give people. And it's good advice. I certainly tell my patients to stop smoking, uh, work very hard on that, uh, talk about cutting down on alcohol, exercise, all of those, you know, the, the holy trinity of health promotion, and all of these other really great tips. It's, it's good advice. But when you look at this list, I like this list for a number of reasons. This list shows us the social determinants of health compared with other el elements of what goes into whether we'll be healthy or not. And you don't really see that previous list on there. The things that make the biggest difference are actually how much money we make, how far we go in school, what, uh, what those thousand first days of our lives are like, other social factors. The other reason I like this slide is it breaks it down into the numbers. It shows you just relatively how much impact healthcare has in comparison with those social factors. And this is probably even a little bit generous to healthcare in terms of what the studies do suggest. But we recognize that while most of our efforts go into, and most of our funding goes into doctors, hospitals, pharmacies, nurses, really that's not the most impactful. 
And the other reason I show this slide, and this is a, a shout out to Dr. Turnbull, T Turnbull and the work that's been done at the CMA. This is from the Canadian Medical Association, which in the last decade, under the leadership of presidents like Jeff, has really gone in a direction of becoming strong advocates for health, and in particular for addressing the social determinants of health, which I think is a, a sea change in my experience uh, since the CMA that I saw in, during my training to the, to the current pattern, which is really much more encouraging. So if we're gonna take those uh, social determinants of health into account, this is the advice that perhaps we should be giving our patient. Don't be poor, pick better parents. Uh, have a good, have a car, have a decent job, have a safe place to stay, access good food. All of these things that are you know, obviously framed, phrased in a bit of a tongue-in-cheek way, but you can see how that puts into relief the difference between the advice that we give people, which is so focused on the individual, and what really has an impact, which is much more caused by our collective realities and the policy environment in which we live. Another way of phrasing this was very succinctly put by the famed pathologist Rudolf Virchow. Virchow was a, anyone who's been in medical school learned about Virchow's triad and Virchow's node, but he also was a politician. And he said that medicine is really a social science and politics is nothing but medicine on a larger scale. And that quote has certainly inspired me in, in some of my advocacy activities, but also causes me to ask some questions. What, if we see politics as medicine on a larger scale, do politicians see the same thing? Do they look at themselves and say, I'm really a physician for this population. My job, my primary purpose is to improve their health. I think if we did, if they did, we'd see this kind of approach, health in all policies, where whether it's a decision made in health or in justice, transport, education, any of the ministries or departments, the question would be asked, is the decision ahead of us going to improve health or make it worse? And that we would preferential, preferentially make those decisions that improve health. It makes a lot of sense, right? Almost so much that you would wonder, doesn't that already happen? Uh, but I think this slide really shows what the reality is, which is, this is the Canadian in Index of Well-Being. So that's a measure, a numerical measure of basically the quality of our lives. Health outcomes, educational outcomes, uh, amount of people in the justice system, our democratic engagement, the health of our environment. And it's compared here to GDP. And what you see is a massive growth in the last decades in the economy of this country, but very little of that translating into actual improvements in the quality of our lives. So if this is the goal, if it, economic success is the primary goal and that's all we're trying to achieve, whopping success, we're doing really well. If politics is supposed to be medicine on a larger scale, this is malpractice. Right? We're, we're not doing it right. We're failing to translate the gains economically into real improvements in our lives. So why do we look at that? Because I think it demonstrates the current frames, economics as the most important thing, austerity mindset, and the need for a new frame. Frames are the terms of argument. And you know, if you're in that existing frame of economics as the most important thing, the response to people's, uh, the response might be, well, here's a better plan for the economy. But that limits our possibilities. It limits what's available in the so-called Overton's window of political options. We need a new frame. And what I've been proposing through Upstream and, and a healthy society is this idea of health as our frame. And I propose that for a few reasons. One, it's something we care about. Our language is full of references to healthy appetites, healthy debates, and that interest in health is reflected constantly in Canadian pollings. This is a, a poll from the, or a study from the most recent federal election and looking back at elections all the way to the early 90s, and that green line at the top is healthcare. Always that issue of most importance to Canadians. So it's something that matters to us. It's also something that's meaningful. If you, if you take the World Health Organization's definition, 
not just the absence of illness, but full physical, social, and mental well-being. And can you think of a better motto for what we'd want to try to achieve as a city, as a province, as a, as a country? So we have something we want to achieve. We have a destination that's meaningful and measurable. We can see whether our health is improving or not. And we have a roadmap on how to reach it. When we look back to that list of social determinants of health, ranked in this list by their impact, we really have a guide for where we need to invest if we want to achieve the best health. Now, this is a policy that, or a, a concept, social determinants of health, that's been known for decades, officially titled that since the White House studies, but understood since the days of Virchow and even Hippocrates. But it's been described as existing in something of phantom zone. The other children of the 70s will recognize the Superman 2 reference here, the bad guys off where you can see them, but they're actually not able to have any impact. And that's where what social determinants of health has often been described as. But there's been a real change. And uh, this is Sir Michael Marmot, who's been one of the leaders, the author of the Whitehall study. And he says uh, that I should stop talking about the phantom zone, that it's really a concept that has come out of the margins and started to be mainstream, the CMA, we're hearing more of it from elected officials and we're starting slowly to see this come out in the public. And some of the evidence of that happening are documents like um, the physician role in health equity from the CMA and this best advice document on social determinants of health from the Canadian College of Family Physicians. And really what this is about is how to advocate best for populations and address social determinants of health from the vantage point of a practicing physician or other healthcare provider. And you know, I think that's a very important thing for us to keep in mind because in the UK there's a study that showed that one in six Brits trust their politicians but nine in ten trust their doctors and similar numbers are here and in the United States and with that trust comes power and comes an ability to use your voice to achieve something you want. And we can focus that on achieving better salaries for ourselves, or we can focus on achieving better health outcomes for the population, a la Spidey. We had a reference from the Dean, thank you very much, to social accountability and the importance of that and how this really is at the heart of our profession. This is what, why we exist as a profession, is to address health. And this concept of social accountability urges us to think more deeply about that and really try to examine the, the gaps in our service and research and education in terms of how we're addressing priority health needs for our population. But there are objections to this. You know, some people would say, that's not really my job. I trained to be in a clinic. But when you look at the CanMed's role, right there, it's health advocate, very prominent. And, and other of those roles really do apply as well to how we work in partnership, work with communities. It really is at the core of what we try to do, especially if you think that you didn't go into your profession saying, I want to do this procedure or ask this history. You wanted to make people better. And when the procedure and the history make people better, great. But if that's not enough, we need to be thinking at different levels. And those levels have been described very well in that CFPC paper. Uh, urging us to be better avocados. Um, avocat in French is avocado and lawyer advocate, so I think that's why they chose the image. I, I like it a lot. But they talk about the three different levels, micro, meso, and macro. So right, that individual patient level, the larger community level, and then society as a whole. A couple of great examples at the micro level. One is out of Toronto, where there's been a group led by Gary Block and others looking at screening for poverty. So asking that question of your patients, do you have enough money to make it through the month? And if you don't, how can we connect you to better resources and how can we change our approach to your clinical care as well, recognizing that there are uh, different risk levels associated with poverty. We're starting to do something similar in Saskatchewan, expanding it to all of the social determinants of health. So we've designed a iPad-based tool that the patient fills out while waiting to see the provider. And they answer a series of questions on 
determinants of health, and then it's linked electronically to the 211 database, a searchable database of available social programs, so that in that visit, the clinician goes from, I care about the social determinants of health, but don't know what to do about them, to a set of real tools right in front of them to say, this patient would benefit from you calling this number or connecting to this program or filling out this form. The Upstream Doctors is a book out of the States that looks at the meso level, at different clinical groups that are working with, for example, food security, community garden programs in their, in their community, or working, providing clinical services in a housing co-op, et cetera. So really looking at the environment in which that clinic exists and what kind of a neighbor is it. And then as we look to the macro level, here's an example of physician advocacy that's been very successful in Canada over the last few years. The response to the cuts to the interim federal health program for refugees, which physicians and other health providers and professional organizations like CMA, Canadian Nurses Association, and other really came out strongly against those cuts, which reduced care for all levels of refugee and, and practically eliminated it for some categories of refugees. And they did pretty impressive things. They got into the streets for days of action that this is advertising and, and also went through the courts to fight those cuts. And the result was major uh, regression in those cuts or, or return of those services. And now we have a commitment from the new government to return them to the previous level. This is also of particular interest to me. I'm from Saskatchewan. 50 years before those cuts, we had protests from doctors against the introduction of Medicare. We had physicians in the streets saying they didn't want universal coverage. Now, we, can, we could parse out what they were thinking and why, but uh, the reality is two things. One, within five years, the vast majority recognized that it actually was a better system to have Medicare available for their patients. And two, 50 years later, instead we see physicians in the same exact streets and this was a, a source of great joy for me to be a part of uh, 50 years later now advocating for universal care and not uh, leaving any groups marginalized. Now, I'm gonna go to one level, one next level of macro and we're gonna try something out here. It's not gonna work, okay. All right, I was gonna show you a video, but I'll, I'll encourage you to find it. But the, the video tells a story of kids in the river. So you've got a story that many of you have heard before, but imagine for a moment you're standing at the edge of a river and you see a, a baby floating by. And brave soul that you are, you dive in and you haul that kid to shore. But then along comes kid number two. So you gotta dive in and save that kid as well. And then kid three and four, there's all kinds of children drowning in the river. So as well as saving some yourself, you're calling all your friends, you're getting everybody involved in trying to save these lives. But eventually, hopefully, somebody will be bright enough to say, wait a minute, who keeps chucking these kids in the river? And they go upstream to try and find out. Uh, we didn't always, we do have this animated video that is from thinkupstream.net that shows that in an animated form. But before we had that, I, I needed to give this talk and, and talk about it. So I threw my son in the South Saskatchewan River just to really illustrate that. So if you ever ask him who keeps chucking the kids in the river, he's, he's got a very singular answer. Uh, just before you call Child Protective Services, Andrea, uh, you can see me, you can just make me out under the water holding up, I, I swear, I swear. I'm sure his therapist will find it a very entertaining story someday. So what that refers to, of course, that upstream story, which is you know, a, a sticky idea. It's one of those notions that once you start thinking about prevention and health through that mindset, it's hard to forget about it. It's hard to go back to saying healthcare is the most important thing when you realize that that's just fishing kids out of the river and not keeping them from falling in in the first place. And Upstream is really a movement to try and share this idea of health as our primary goal and the social determinants of health as the roadmap to reach that destination. We're a national nonprofit organization, nonpartisan organization, dedicated to really shifting the frame of Canadian discourse around health and, and politics as a whole. 
The way we do that, we've got our three uh, boats there that make up the logo, and those refer to the three parts of the organization, the think tank, where we work with experts and advocates from across the country to identify what are the best policy options available to address the social determinants of health. We then connect with authors and artists and videographers to try and tell those stories in a meaningful way. Because if you don't connect to real lives, then all of the facts in the world are, are going to make no impact in, in changing people's opinions on, on what the best options are. And through those stories and that evidence, we work to build a community of individuals and organizations around the country who are in their own campaigns, in their own activities, using that social determinants of health and upstream language so that over time, that becomes the mainstream approach to thinking about policy, a longer term view with a focus on health outcomes. An example of this at work in Saskatchewan, last year we worked with the food bank and the health region to encourage our government, which is one of only two that doesn't have a poverty reduction strategy, to invest in one of those. And the way we did that, we started with the evidence. We crunched the numbers and showed that $3.8 billion is lost each year to the Saskatchewan economy due to poverty. And that's about two-thirds of that due to decreased economic activity, the other third through increased health, social services, justice costs. But then recognizing we needed to connect that evidence to emotion, we worked with people actually living in poverty who were willing to share their stories. Stories like Olivia, whose mother had to quit her job because Olivia needed glasses, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but if she was working at her minimum wage job, she couldn't afford the glasses, but if she was on social assistance, she had benefits to cover it. So that you can see how that's a step backwards for that family and for society as a whole. So telling those stories, we got people together with this poverty cost campaign, write letters, and connect with their MLAs, and the result was that we actually got a commitment from the provincial government, from the Premier, premier to have a poverty reduction strategy, and he, he even invited myself and others involved in poverty costs to help write, the, at the very least, the recommendations for that strategy, which is this document, which included a, a recommendation to drop poverty by 50% within the next five years and looked at, among other things, the idea of basic income. This notion that if we have a floor between, below which we let no one go, if you file your taxes and you're above a certain level you pay taxes, if you're below that level you actually get topped up to the level you need to survive in today's society. That with that, not only could we very obviously drop poverty, as income is the way we measure poverty, we could also give people the opportunity to get beyond the so-called welfare wall, the limitations that are in place for people who are on social assistance that often make it more difficult for them to find work or to thrive in other ways. So these are the kind of ideas that I, I think connect back to that notion again of health in all policies. And we're really, again, with the new uh, New federal government and hopefully some new openness to these sorts of ideas, that's our, our next phase, is to really try and promote this idea of health in all policies. We're bringing Sir Michael Marmot to Canada in April to, uh, to, for a conference to focus on that idea. And we're hopeful that over time, we can continue to shift the discourse towards this idea of health as the most important goal for our society. Now, this work is Exciting work. It's wonderful to be able to come and talk to folks like you and to uh, work with luminaries like Drs. Turnbull and Dasani and, and think about these issues. But there's also you know, some tension there because, well, I'm going to do a half-day clinic this week instead of two full days of clinic because I'm off doing these talks. And there's patients that I really want to see and want to see me, and that's what I train to do. And so there's always a bit of... Uh, a bit of a tension there about doing this kind of work, but it only takes going back to clinic for a day and seeing my patients back again with the same things or somebody else who's come to the clinic with, a, with an illness that isn't related to the clinic. It's related to whether they have work or not, whether they have enough money, whether they have access to food, and we just send them back into the same conditions that made them sick in the first place. 
And until we have social change, we're not going to see the real results that we want out of our clinical responses. But in order to have that social change, we need a frame that allows the space for that social change. With that, I uh, encourage you to uh, check out Upstream Action in, and join us again this evening for the talk with, uh, with your mayor and uh, Martin Olshinsky, the law prof from here at UFC, to discuss uh, more ways we can look at health and its intersection with how we make policy and how we think about politics. And uh, that's it for me. Thanks very much for your time.